All right, welcome everybody. My name is E.R. Anderson. I'm the executive director of Kara Circle, and Kara Circle is the South's. Uh, it's connected to the South's oldest independent feminist bookstore, Karis Books and More. Karis Books is 45 years old, and we're located in Decatur, Georgia. Uh, I am coming to you live not from Karis Books, but from my uh, home office. But I'm thrilled to be here with two folks who are going to um, have an amazing conversation with us tonight. First, I want to introduce Elder Roeder. Elder is the vice president and publisher for Penguin Classics. She oversees the U.S. editorial program, including the works of John Steinbeck, Arthur Miller, Shirley Jackson. William Golding, Amy Tan, Alice Walker, and the Pelican Shakespeare series. She has created and edited several series, including the new Penguin Vitae hardcover series featuring the work of Audre Lorde, which we just celebrated. I was saying uh, that was one of the last books that we celebrated with Mahogany Brown in February, right before the pandemic. Um, and the forthcoming Penguin Liberty series about constitutional rights. She's the editor of Fairest by Meredith Toulousen, published by Viking, and Leg Legendary Children by Tom Fitzgerald and Lorenzo Marquez, published by Penguin Books. Elda is a board member for the Academy of American Poets and Kundiman, a national organization dedicated to Asian American creative writing. So welcome, Elda. And we're here tonight celebrating Meredith Toulousen. Meredith is an award-winning author and journalist who is the founding executive editor of Them. Condé Nast LGBTQ plus digital platform where she is now a contributing editor. She has contributed to other books, including the New York Times bestseller, Not That Bad, edited by Roxane Gay, Nasty Women and Burn It Down. She writes frequently for the New York Times, The Guardian, The Atlantic, Wired, Condé Nast Traveler and many other publications. She lives in the Western Cat Skills with her spouse and rescue mutt. So welcome Meredith. I'm thrilled to have you both here. We're thrilled to have everybody in the chat. Thanks to all of you for um, starting to chime in and say where you're from and all those things. Um, you'll see a button in the middle of your screen that says, ask a question. That's where you are going to, of course, ask your questions. So um, Elda is gonna be asking many of her own questions tonight. We're gonna be playing a game and doing a lot of fun stuff, but um, we'd love for you to ask questions while you're here and we'll incorporate them. Um, but in the meantime, just uh, kick back, make yourself at home, and enjoy this conversation. Thank, thank you. Thank you, ER. Yeah. And thank you, Karis Books, for having us. And hello, Meredith. How Hi. are you? Hi. Um, you you. Our, our, um... <laughs> <laughs> this is not going to be a traditional book interview. We're sorry. talking about um, coordinating our. Uh, Already too Filipino, too Filipino okay. already. Okay, okay, okay. <laughs> but I am, I okay. am matching. You are matching heads. Yes. You okay. Are. So um, now I feel like I need to stay exactly like in this place. <laughs> no, you can move. Okay. Can match. <laughs> um, I just wanted to congratulate you on publishing Ferrest, and it's. I'm just going to get mushy immediately. It's been a real honor to be your editor. And I'm just so happy that it's out in the world. And suffice to say, it has been the most challenging time, the most important time to have a book like yours out. But what makes me feel good about your book out is that there are so many bridges in this book that you are reaching out to all the potential readers. And I hope that you've known from the readers who have been with you in the events over the last month that you've already made these connections. Thank you so much. I mean, of course, I couldn't have done it without you. And, um, you know, you've been such a wonderful, supportive editor. I, you know, like, I can't really imagine um, how much better the process um, of working on it could have been. And, you know, like, it's been an immense honor and a pleasure. And thank you so much for, you know, like not asking me to explain what Yema is or Polvoron or <laughs> all of the various things that I've had to, um, that I've had to explain in various manuscripts <laughs> since, yeah. since I started writing for various public companies. Um, and yeah, and, and it is, it has been, um, you know, kind of a challenging period to launch a book. And I think, I think for me, it has been less about, um, you know, like, uh, it has been less about the, the fact that, um, that the book 
is, you know, like has come out amid all of this like chaos and unrest. It's more um, just this feeling of, of my, um, my attention and my focus and my energy being divided, right? You know, like simultaneously mm -hmm. knowing that there are, you know, these really, really urgent concerns that we have to address you know, like right at this moment to make sure that they can continue to get addressed three months, a year, you know, like five years, 10 years throughout our lifetimes, et cetera, et cetera, so that people can remember this specific moment. While at the same time, you know, kind of also being aware that my book has contributions to make, not necessarily in that space of, you know, like white people need to learn, you know, like what it, what the basic, you know, like tenets of anti-racism and anti-blackness are, or white fragility, but more in terms of, you know, kind of like a longer term understanding of how race and gender shapes our lives and how, you know, and how depending on the specific intersections that you hold, that those intersections really have a huge, huge effect on the possibilities of your future in America, right? Um, and so that those two concerns have definitely been a lot to balance and, um, and, you know, like Viking PR and marketing has just been incredible in terms of there's been a lot of improvisation. <laughs> yeah. It's Happy. a wonderful team. And yeah. everyone has just been, um, super, super supportive and yeah. And, you know, like your support, obviously, like it means the world and, um, so and we're yeah. in it for the long run, you know? Yeah, and it's yeah. and and um and yeah, it's it's my last official event on my virtual book tour, so we're both getting a little bit nostalgic. <laughs> <laughs> um, well, because I have been watching like an overprotective auntie virtually on many of your events, I yeah. thought perhaps your last one for this month is we would be a little bit playful, Absolutely. and um, I picked up this little. This is a plug. Well, there's Viking Books is published Paris, but this is a for Chronicle Books because this is from Chronicle. Um, it's a little card game called Do You Remember? And we keep it on our dining table because um, I try to have um, our family and particularly my kids have conversations. And so like nobody will be staring at a screen. Right. It's not always that successful, but <laughs> these cards are quite interesting to me because I have curated a pile of them. Um, we don't have to do all of them, but just some of them. Mm -hmm. Remind me of parts of your book, remind me of the uh, experiences editing your book. And I just wanted to help you riff on the cards and just talk about, you know, memoir and memory as an example. Mm -hmm. So I'm just gonna dive in and ask you one. So let's just do a virtual like, Point to one of the cards. Oh, right. Um, <laughs> I want to point to a middle card. A middle card. Yeah, Let's that one. That one's good. Oh, okay. This is fun. Mm -hmm. Do you remember the first band or singer you really, really liked? Oh my God. I mean, that is that is completely obvious, right? Um, yeah, when I was very, very young, you know, the first, the very first tape that I ever got was a tape of Lea Salonga, um, who um, at the time, she's four years older than me. So I must have been five and she must have been nine. Um, and she came out with this album called Small Voice. And, um, and it was really my first real exposure I mean, I'm, I'm sure I would have been, I, I had been exposed to English before, but it was really the first time that I made a concerted effort to learn English words because I was just completely and utterly in love with her voice and both her voice and the fact that even as a young child, I could tell that she pronounced English words more similarly to Americans than she did other Filipinos. And that was, you know, the kind of like that ability to, um, you know, to kind of shape shift to code switch was, was just like super seductive 
to me as a child. And it's a quality, you know, if you notice in both Leia Salong and I have, right, that if people follow her, she has since been the voice of Mulan and Jasmine and Disney. She's been on Broadway. She won a Tony Award for Miss Saigon for people who aren't familiar. You know, like when she's in the US, she has an American accent. When she's in the UK, she has a British accent. And when she's in the Philippines, she has a Filipino accent. Um, I didn't know that. And I'm exactly, I'm exactly the same way. Um, just because like we pick up the accents that are around us. Um, and, um, and that's just, and I have no idea if that's something that I acquired from her or if we had that same, you know, kind of like innate ability and we both, and that was part of why I was so drawn to her. Um, but yeah, but Leia Salonga. And if you don't know her, you should, cause she's, I mean, she's like the, uh, she's what is the she icon. The, 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 the goddess of the, I can't remember. There's a specific title that, that Filipinos give her, but yeah, she's amazing. She, uh, when I, my family went to the Philippines for the first time in many, many years last summer, actually at this, this exact week. And she was everywhere, like ads and, you know, just everywhere, Tele like skincare to telephone companies, Uniqlo. But I, I agree, uh, growing up for myself too, she was quite the icon. And I, I didn't realize what kind of career she had before Miss Saigon. But when she was in Miss Saigon, I think every every Filipina in, uh, in the United States sort of like stepped back and sort of in awe, was like very happy and excited to have her and her voice represent. Yeah, and she was the, you know, she was such a groundbreaking Broadway star too. You know, she mm -hmm. was the first non-white Eponine in, in Les Miserables and, and has, you know, gone on to play Fantine. And so, you know, she was one of those people who was non-traditionally cast at a time when that was, you know, when that was significantly more rare. And I think, you know, there's this degree to which, um, you know, like her talent made that possible, right? That 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 a lot of times for um, for um, minority actors to be cast in roles that are traditionally played by white people, the way that they make a case for themselves is to be clearly, um, you know, like to be clearly head and shoulders above anybody else who wants to play the role. And I think I haven't thought of that before, but I definitely also operate on that principle um, as a trans person, just because like, I know up until very recently <laughs> that, you know, that it's very easy for people to discriminate against me, but it's harder for them to discriminate against me if there's nobody else who can do my job. <laughs> it comes with the territory, I guess. Okay. All right, let's pick second to last on, okay. the, on that side, yes. Do you remember the most beautiful place you've ever been? Who the most beautiful place I've ever been. I've been incredibly lucky to have been in a lot of different places, um, but the one that immediately comes to mind is the Banawe Rice Terraces. I've never been. Um, which um, are in the northern part of the Philippines, and they're, um, you know, and and essentially because of the fact that that's a super mountainous region, um, the native people there, the Ifugao, um, terraced the land in that region so that they could, um, you know, so that they could cultivate more rice um, in, you know, like in such a mountainous area. And to this day, you know, they, they are still continuing to do that. Um, they are, um, they, they um, still do, you know, like you can't, you can't farm mechanically. You can't, you know, you can't have tractors or anything, you know, like they still do everything by hand, which is, which is really amazing. And also, um, yeah, and I spent, I actually spent a significant amount of time there because back in the day, um, before Meredith the writer, I was a PhD comparative literature student and I actually um, studied Ifugao um, for oh, a time. I didn't know that. 
because I was really interested, you know, the obscure interests, I was really interested in Ifugao love songs um, because Ifugao, because the Ifugao love song is constructed so that um, work always precedes love, that, that like you have to get your work done first before you are allowed to, you know, to like engage in romantic relationships. And there's always like this huge emphasis on work. There's always this huge emphasis on that, like you have to fulfill your duties before, you know, before any romance can happen. And I found that, I, I just found that deeply fascinating. And um, they have a lot of really fascinating um, just linguistic structures in their verses that, um, yeah, that I'm super interested in. So one day you might you might actually get okay. nerdy. I, I can try to like convert that into some sort of like creative treatment so that um, wow. so that people can read it and not kind of like fall asleep if they're not nerdy. Uh, <laughs> I, I think the uh, you know academics before romantic love sounds un incredibly familiar if you're <laughs> raised by Filipino parents. Why yeah. not? You know. Yeah. Um, okay. Uh, yeah. Okay. Uh, let's see. I feel like I like. There's one over there near the middle that's sort of separate from every. Yeah, that one. Oh, good. Yeah. Okay. Oh no, I can't give you this because it, I know what your answer is going to be. <laughs> okay. uh, can I give you the question? The question is: Do you remember whom you idolized as a teenager? So, as an editor, I'm striking that because okay. you answered yes. with Leia. Yeah. I'll just do the one right next to it. Okay. Do you remember someone you wish you could give thanks to and for what? Well, um, I, I definitely give thanks to my grandmother, right? Um, who is a figure um, that is really important in, who is really important in the book. And she um, unfortunately died in, um, in 2015. So, um, and she raised me um, because, you know, because my parents both had me when they were very young and they actually hadn't finished college yet. So, um, I was sent to live with my grandmother and then sent to live with my parents when I was about, you know, like two or three years old. And then after a couple of years, my grandmother was just like, no children, you're not raising this child, you know, correctly. So I, you know, so I'm going to, take this child back. And um, so, yeah, and and she was a really important figure in my life. And, um, and, you know, kind of apart from just being the, the, a figure in my life in a time of turmoil who loved me unconditionally, and I felt that unconditional love, she was also the person who really instilled so much of my moral and ethical compass, which I think would have been much more difficult for me to develop had I, you know, like not had her um, as a figure in my life. And, um, and I'm super, you know, like I'm super thankful for that, you know, because they, because they feel like. Oh. Meredith, are you frozen? I think she is frozen, but I think we'll just give her a second to hopefully unfreeze. Okay. Thanks everyone for waiting. <laughs> I use that strategicness and connivingness for good <laughs> rather than evil. <laughs> and I'm not sure, and, and I'm not sure if that would have been the case had I not been heavily influenced by my grandmother growing up. Well, it's interesting about your book and thinking about art and storytelling. Um, I don't know if you had planned for your Lola among many important people in your life to be one of the pillars of your story. Mm. Um, but I'd love if you wouldn't mind sharing a passage from Ferris now. Oh, absolutely. Would that be absolutely. good? Yes. Um, so this passage is actually, um, the book is divided into three parts, roughly. Um, and then the the first part is set in the Philippines, the second part is set at Harvard, and then the third part, um, you know, kind of like covers 
the period immediately before I decided to transition. But at the beginning of that section, of that third section, was a trip that I took to the Philippines for the millennium in 2000, and which was the first time that I saw my grandmother um, since I left the Philippines a decade before. Um, and since then had um, come out in the States and um, had a live-in partner in the States, even though nobody in the Philippines knew about that. Um, so that's the context. And it's um, the day, it's the day before Christmas. It's around, it's around the holiday time. Okay. Um, one of my aunts invited me to visit her at her new house in the Cainta district of Manila, three hours away at the eastern edge of the sprawling, badly planned metropolis. Nane Koro, that's my grandmother. And Nane means mother in Tagalog, so I, I call her mother in, and I call my mom mama. Um, Nane Koro and I made the trip together a few days after I arrived. The two of us had gotten more used to each other by then, though she had a lot more to adjust to since she was the same doting woman who favored me over everyone else. She's sadder because her beloved husband was dead. Whereas I must have been alien to my grandmother as I created around in my linen pants and designer sunglasses, an impeccable New England by way of Hollywood accent to match. This is typical of immigrants returning home, showing off prosperous lives while hiding the effort and sacrifice, making ourselves appear more moneyed, more accomplished than we actually were. Except I actually was moneyed and accomplished my bank account full of my partner's inherited wealth, my Harvard degree, an unquestionable reality. Though there were times when the memory of that experience didn't feel real even to me. Nane Koro couldn't help but treat me like the child she remembered, maybe because she couldn't understand the person I had actually become. My grandmother humored childhood whims I no longer had, like my dislike of both vegetables and soup. So my, all my meals were a spoiled Filipino brat's fantasy fried chicken, fried pork, fried beef, cured or seasoned with salt and served alongside rice and ketchup. I indulged her by not mentioning that the adult me preferred more complicated dishes, but I was indulging myself too by recalling the simplicity of my life before I was rested for my grandmother. That simplicity itself was a luxury I no longer had as someone who had to flip back and forth between vastly different realities of being, a Filipino who was also American, brown inside, but white outside, deeply in love with a man I hadn't managed to tell my Philippine family about. I had asked Rafe to stay behind at the last minute because it felt too overwhelming to come out to my family and bring a white man home for the, at the same time. How is life in America? My grandmother asked as we sat in crawling Manila traffic, having left the house too late in the afternoon and found that the Christmas season extended our trip by several hours. The equatorial sun had shifted from day to night by then, so much sooner than in America. Among all my close relatives, Nane Koro spoke the least English, so I had to recover my tongue as I tried to wander through a life I'd never thought of in Tagalog before. There is snow in Boston, like shaved ice, except softer, and this makes it very cold. I live in a kind of house called a brownstone because the outside of it is made with stone that is brown. I need drawings. I make drawings on the computer at a school called MIT to show people how the human eye works. As I rendered these scenes for my grandmother in my first language, it occurred to me that I was also translating them for myself, integrating the person I had become with the person I had been before I left, the gulf not so vast that there was no way to travel between the two languages and cultures I knew best. Is there someone you love? She asked, with the verb form she used, minamahal, with a prefix mina, instead of just the simple verb mahal, in a language where verbs not only coded for time, but a subtle shades of feeling, to me sounded more like, is there someone you are loving, more active and ardent? There is, I replied, we live together. I muddled through a picture of my life with Rafe, his kindness and his strength how he was a professor, but also did most of the cooking because he enjoyed it. I knew that my string of sentences would end with me telling my grandmother that I lived with a man, but the convenience of genderless pronouns in Tagalog 
allowed, allowed me to defer that confession. Actually, the two of you remind me of each other, both smart and nice, I said. And I could tell, even in the dark, that my grandmother was smiling. Next time, you bring him, Danny Cora said in careful English. And I was surprised to find myself unfazed by her knowledge and the deliberate switch to a language she barely spoke, just to tell me she knew without needing to discuss it at length. I realized then that I never really doubted her acceptance, but I was so afraid to tell her because it would mean that I could never again be perfect in her eyes, someone she and my family could unquestionably be proud of, getting to my aunt's house with the knowledge that this part of me was no longer a secret between us. I felt more complete than I had in a long time. Thank you. That has always been one of my favorite sections. And um, there's so many parts of your book that have been so impactful to me. And a physical reaction, I tell lots of people, is I was sighing in my office. I just come out into the hallway and be like, oh, this chapter. Yeah. And then I go back to my desk <laughs> and then I like read more and then I come back and it was usually Elizabeth and I'd say, and you know, Elizabeth's very busy. I'm like, no, wait, I need to tell you about this, this next chapter. Um, somebody um, who I gave an early copy of your book to, um, I thought gave it quite high praise. Um, and I'll tell you later who that was, but that person described it as, as a modern classic. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. There are parts of your book, so much about it, from seeking your authentic self to desirability, to the relationships you've had with loved ones, and from childhood all through your uh, the early years of your adult life are scenes that are so memorable that I see people teaching, like teaching some of these chapters. Um, I hope that it comes, it that Ferris finds itself in classrooms. Um, and I hope that it's you already but knew that they're going to be teaching it. So yeah, yeah. So I, that's something that I'm really, that I'm really looking forward to because so many, you know, like so many of my influences came from, you know, the teachers introducing me to books. I think a lot about, for whatever reason, I've been thinking a lot about Jamaica Kincaid recently, mm -hmm. um, just because she you know, like she was one of the earliest people that I read who wrote about that immigrant experience, that experience of like, of of being from somewhere else and ending up in America mm -hmm. and like being completely discombobulated and like not, you know, like not knowing what to make of it. I just remember this amazing passage in Lucy, which I experienced, where she talks about how you grow up associating the sun with warmth. So you have this impulse whenever it's sunny to just go out because it's gonna be warm. And, it, and it's so, and I still feel that way, right? Like even when I know that in the middle of winter, when it's 30 degrees and it's sunny, it's not, it's not gonna be warm, right? Yeah. Um, you know, like I, I, I remember those moments. And, and I think one of the things that has been really um, important for me as an author is to find those moments in my experience, right? To find, um, you know, to, to reach for those memories in such a way that I'm telling my story, not, you know, rather than, and, and that I feel like that's one of the most wonderful things about memoir and, you know, like, and autobiographical fiction, right? Is that a lot of times you just end up with these experiences that you just can't, it's just really, really hard to make them up. <laughs> yeah. You know, right. um, and, um, and that, that actually the act of deliberating on and revising and remembering them allows you to form this sort of like vivid picture that is, you know, that's all your own rather than Absolutely. something that you've, you know, just because especially as a trans person, I feel like um, stories about us are told so often from the perspective of, 
you know, the general public trying to understand our lives. Mm -hmm. We feel like we, we assume those stories, you know, like we absorb those stories so that it kind of becomes really difficult to tell the stories of ourselves because we've been subsumed, you know, like in all of these narratives about us to make us yeah. relatable. Actually including, you know, like narrating our lives from before transition. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, like even the notion that I'm narrating about being a gay man from a place that isn't, you know, that isn't explicitly, oh, I hated it right or like oh there's nothing about it that's redeemable is actually is actually not is actually new for a lot mm -hmm. of people right yeah and i would say on the side of the publisher and the editor um because there's so much talk now about what gets published and what voices are heard is the ability to be confident in the fact that when your author is as authentic and specific as possible that's where the real art is you know the language is true to that person's decision on shaping a memoir and and not falling into these um pitfalls of saying like well that doesn't make sense like that storytelling really isn't what my assumption would be right. um and a lot of it is to check oneself for unconscious bias as an editor and a publisher and also the colleagues that we work with um and i think that that's really important to have an honest conversation between an author and an editor, an author and a publishing team, um, because that's where the, the power is. It's like you're choosing to shape a story the way it feels right to you. And it it's hard, I know, probably for a lot of writers to shake off what is considered um, acceptable or what would be considered great literature if you, if you wrote in a certain way or if you included certain perspectives that you really don't want to write about. Right. And I haven't told um, you this, but you've been, you, you know, because I'm an editor too, and you've been, you've had a heavy influence on the way that I edit, you know, just because I feel like, you know, like I feel like as an editor, you really are so wonderful about, you know, sort of like getting, getting, being able to, to um, express your point of view without, you know, like make, making me as a writer feel like you're imposing your point of view. And I feel like that that's very difficult, you know, like especially in that like really, really delicate stage when something is, you know, when something is in draft, right? Where, where you have to strike that really fine balance between, you know, trying to make suggestions in order to make a draft better while at the same time, you know, kind of like not, imposing your own vision of the manuscript, um, which carries with it, you know, potential biases, especially if, you know, the, if it's somebody who is from a background that is not, um, you know, that is not the same as yours, right? And, and yeah. that's been, and I think working with you has definitely made me aware of the fact that, you know, that there've been times, you know, that earlier in my editing career, I've been heavy handed I think out of a place of insecurity a lot of the time, right? You know, because you're just like, you're a new editor, you want to prove yourself, you want mm -hmm. to prove that you're, you know, that you have like your stamp on this article or whatever. And I think, and I think that, you know, like working with you has been, you know, like such a wonderful model in terms of like, oh, I, um, it, it made me understand better what it, what it means to, you know, to be collaborative. Um, rather than, I don't know, like rather than the power relationship between editor and writer, you know, that the editor mm -hmm. kind of like imposes, um, you know, kind of like a certain, a certain hierarchical power structure. Um, yeah, I, I, thank you. I, I think um, I've it over, it's taken some time and I'm still on this journey, but what I've grown to be comfortable with is um, sharing where, if I'm like, okay, I'm just going to try this idea. Like I'm on a boat with you and you're pointing things out and I don't know what those things are. So I'm just asking you like, where's the tree or where's the creature on the tree? And what is that? Creature? So I have to be comfortable with not knowing everything. And I, <laughs> that's okay with me because mm -hmm. if I'm sharing that I'm not sure 
or I need some clarification, that's a that's a chance for the author to clarify more. But I also am pretty comfortable with not really connecting all the dots because that's also art, right? Sometimes a connection can be emotional. It doesn't have to always be intellectual. Sometimes it's the other way around. And I don't necessarily feel it's my place to, to get everything, but I'm, I'm happy to be on the boat. <laughs> I'm, happy to, I'm happy to be sailing with you. And I, I, I don't know why I even use that. Um, example because I don't even swim well, but um, <laughs> but you know I'm trying to. That's what I do. I learned how to swim as an adult. It's I learned how to swim after I read Lydia Yuknovich's Chronology of Water. Um, because because it made you want to swim, or because she you were was a competitive swimmer, <gasps> and she talked about how you know just sort of like how meditative the swimming practice is, and that was the period I I. I was a dancer for a very long time. And that was a period of time when I was just like, I'm getting older, my joints are getting creakier. I should probably, you know, like pick up a physical activity that isn't as hard on my body. So so I learned. And and of course, like me being me, I started like training for adult, you know, whatever, like freestyle competitions and things. Because yeah, like my husband was very was both amused and frustrated by my tendency to be an all or nothing person. <laughs> well, back to the cards, because yes. they seem to have voted well for this conversation. Um, let's see, there is, let's, let's try the very right side this time. We haven't, that side this, has been unrepresented. This side? Yes. Or this side, okay. Or this, yes. Let's try this one. Do you remember a cherished family routine? A cherished family routine. Um, yes, uh, the the one that I cherish the most, and it might be gross to the Americans among you, among you, or the native-born Americans among you, is that pretty much like every Filipino person in a rural area at some point has lice, and usually like on a super regular basis. So you have to you know, check for lice regularly, probably, I'm trying to think, maybe it was, it wasn't, it wasn't a weekly activity, but it was definitely like one of those things. It's just like a regular part of life in um, rural Philippines. And as, and you would actually see in villages in the af like weekend afternoons where people would like sit on stairs. It, it's kind of like that, um, you know, like you see it in nature documentaries where like, you know, where like chimps are grooming each other. That's kind of what it reminds me of a lot. Yeah, of that's very comforting to me, by the way, <laughs> just to watch that. <laughs> yeah, and so, um, but then I couldn't fully participate in this activity because, um, because my hair was blonde and the lice were dark. Um, it was very easy to remove the lice. Um, on my head, and then also I couldn't see the lice on other people's heads. And this was deeply, deeply frustrating to me <laughs> as a child. And so my grandmother started faking, like she started like artificially like looking for lice, um, you know, like for just as long on my head as other kids because she noticed, um, she noticed this frustration. And then she also, what she got me to do was I became the, I became the lice killer, you know, <laughs> she pretended that she couldn't like kill the lice effectively. So I was the person who like, she just gave me the lice and then That's something to do. the one to crush it on my fingernail. She was the same with, you know, like when we picked mangoes, I would be the one to like, she would like drop the mango on the ground and I would be the one to, so she always tried to integrate me into the activities even when, you know, because they couldn't climb trees. They, they wouldn't let me climb trees as a kid, even though that is, you know, just kind of like a Filipino childhood ritual. And so yeah. it was just like the tree, the fruit picker um, on the ground. She was very good at that. She was Love very it. good at like making me feel like I was part of the activity and I was useful. Um, and that's something, that's something that I also, but I also think that's, that's also a culturally Filipino thing, you know, like we mm -hmm. haven't really talked about disability 
Um, you know, because I'm albino, mm -hmm. I have low vision. And, and actually what's really interesting is that albino vision is worse when you're a child. It actually stabilizes. Um, it actually gets better usually through your 20s and then, and then plateaus. Mm -hmm. It was actually a lot, my vision was a lot worse when I was a kid. And so, um, and, and, but in the Philippines, unlike in the States, in the Philippines, you're just kind of expected to, you know, to sort of like go along with things and people are less, you know, like there, there are, you know, people are just like, okay, well, you know, like you don't have this capacity, so we'll figure out some way to adapt that is like super organic and not, mm -hmm. you know, like at least in my experience, wasn't really stigmatizing at all. I don't know, you know, like I don't know if that's true for, you know, like for every, for other disabled Filipino people. But I do think the fact that it's such a communal culture um, made it a lot easier for me to, um, you know, to adapt as a disabled person to a point where by the time I came to America and people tried, I feel like in high school, people tried to make me feel bad and tried to mm -hmm. you know, like bully me in various ways, but I just didn't really understand. My consciousness was already too fully formed. And so they just didn't find it fun to try to bully me <laughs> because I didn't, you know, like I didn't have the reaction that yeah. I was expecting. Yeah. I have to say, and uh, this is just a quick commercial to say that if you don't have Ferris yet, feel free to go to Karis Books and purchase a copy for yourself and a loved one. Um, I have to say that your descriptions about sight were some of the most poetic parts of the book. And, and it was just interesting to me, um, descriptions that you had, because they also, some of them led to um a question of like inner confidence or strength like a, a bravery that you just had to figure out you know i think a lot about mm, the the description you shared about bowling mm, yeah and and to me in a sense that was kind of like i pictured and you can explain this to the, the people here but um the bravery of you being in an elite environment like harvard and just kind of like not knowing how you can see too far ahead, but going with your skill and your sense of strength from what you can see. Do you want to share a little bit about that scene? Yeah, yeah. So there's a scene in the book um, about that in which I was going into this class. It was actually the first class that I ever went to at Harvard, which happened to be a class called Topics in Gay Male Representation with D.A. Miller, who is, you know, like a really well-known queer scholar and is now um, at Berkeley. He's emeritus at Berkeley. Um, and so it was really scary um, for all of these different reasons. You know, like I hadn't officially come out yet. So it was, you know, so it was always kind of a form of me coming out. It was my first class at Harvard. It was an advanced seminar. Um, you know, like I said, it was an advanced class. And so I spent this period of time trying to like figure out whether I actually had the courage to go in. And then I was sitting, so like, so it was in a, um, it was in Emerson Hall and the, the, um, and so I was sitting on a bench outside of the classroom and um, I was looking down as I was contemplating um, and the floor of Emerson Hall happens to be these like little um, pieces of wood that I realized resembled a bowling alley. Um, and there was a period of time when my mom really got into bowling and she was teaching me how to bowl. Um, and the thing, and I can't actually distinguish the pins. Um, like for me, for my vision, the pins are just like one mass of white to me. So I, you know, so I told her, I don't think I can, I can figure out how to bowl because I can't actually see the pins are too far away. And then um, she just pointed out that there was these arrows um, that were close to, to the, um, you know, closer to the end of the lane. And so if I aimed for an arrow, um, then that arrow is going to lead to the right pin, right? 
Um, and, and I think that sort of less, that physical lesson translated itself into me sort of being like, oh, like I don't actually need to like physically see that far. I just need to be able to see something that is close enough to me that is leading me in the right direction, right? Um, and I think that's definitely become kind of a, a general <laughs> life philosophy for better yeah. or for worse, you know, like I, I feel like, I feel like it, it definitely has, I feel like I've mellowed out um, now, you know, like I feel like I'm much more deliberate in terms of making decisions about my life. Um, but there was definitely a period of time where I feel like I over exerted <laughs> that. The years of the bowling ball, just yeah, you know, just because it's like, oh, like you don't think you don't think I can, you know, study elite dance? Well, watch me, you know, like you don't think I can be a photographer? Well, watch me, right? You know, I can't have two MFAs. Well, you know, here I can get two MFAs, right? Um, you know, but I think now I've become, you know, I can become more more realizing that um, that it actually that you don't have to move in a different direction all the time, that it's actually great to stay on the path that you're on. I'm very happy with the, with the current path that I'm on. <laughs> okay, I am going to, let's see, I, do you wanna do one more of these or do you wanna go to my other game, which is classics related? Um, you, it's, you're the moderator. It's oh, I get to make that decision. Okay, I one more card of this, and then mm -hmm. I'll, can I pick it for you? Yes. Can I? All right, let's see. All right, what does this say? Do you remember a milestone in your career or life that really changed you? Who? Um, the one, the one that very much comes to mind is is the Conde, the Conde phase, <laughs> which I guess is kind of continuing. Um, but there were a number of there were a number of things that happened in the Conde phase. But the one that I very clearly remember, the one that, the one that sticks out is um, me being invited. So there's like a there's a there's there's a regular meeting of like the top editors um, at Conde, and um, and usually like there's an invited guest, and Anna Wintour organizes the meeting, so you just get summoned um, to this meeting. And my boss Philip Picardi, at the time, um, couldn't make it to one of the meetings, so he um, sent me as um as like his replacement for one of the meetings and apparently i asked an, like i asked a, a smart question because i was given my own seat i was offered my own seat um, for future meetings and that was wonderful and of course you know like i was very self-conscious and i you know so i made sure to sort of like dress in a very sort of um i don't know like put together editor way um that sort of like resembled the Vogue aesthetic, except, you know, like I don't have enough money to actually like have the Vogue aesthetic. But then there was this one day when I was coming from a shoot um, where I was supposed to express the them brand, which is much more similar to mine, you know, like my tastes are, um, are more kind of like eclectic and, and just sort of like, you know, like colorful and, you know, like and wild. So then I ended up going to this meeting um, in these like just super kind of like, they, I call them like comic book shoes. They're just sort of like super big and clunky and and just like they, they look like kind of like a comic book character would wear them. And I remember after this meeting, all of the editors, you know, basically like in all of, from all of the brands were at this elevator bay. Um, um, and, and Anna, on her way into the elevator, just says, you know, just says, everybody has been staring at your shoes. <laughs> what does that mean? How? Good way? Bad way? In a good way. Like oh, good way. Goodness. Has been, you know, like everybody. <laughs> no, she said something like super, super complimentary that like everybody, you know, everybody's just like obsessed with your shoes. And then, and then she like swoops into the elevator and the elevator closes, right? It's like this like hyper cinematic. 
moment. And I, I just, I don't know, like, I just remember it, it's, it's really fascinating to be um, in that environment as a person who is fundamentally a book nerd, <laughs> you know, to, to just sort of like, um, be surrounded by the sort of like glamour and the and 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 it has you know like and it's definitely affected me right i am actually wearing like super i don't know if i can i don't know if i can let me let me try yeah. um i'm wearing these fabulous oh look at the pocket look at the pockets <gasps> oh i love and there's the dancer kick i saw the yeah. dancer kick as well um so they're they're chromat pants um, nice. and yeah, and, and, and now that I have, you know, like actually friends in the fashion industry and people that I follow, they're super nice that they, they still allow me to borrow clothes from them. <laughs> I so love it. I don't work at Condé full time anymore. Hey, fashion is storytelling. I love it. Yes. Um, I'm going to transition to the other game now. Okay. You know, people there. Thank you all for being with us, everybody who is watching yeah, and question. commenting. Should we should we answer a question? Let's see. Let's click onto this before we do the classics. Oh. Okay. Let's see. This is from Grace. I think this is Grace, your cousin, perhaps. Hi, cousin Grace. <laughs> Hi, cousin Grace. Um, you might already cover my questions, all connected in your remarks, but I'm interested to know what it was like to work on a book with a cup of iron. How was this beneficial or meaningful or not? If the publishing industry was more diverse in all kinds of ways, what can you imagine changing in regards to published books? Yeah. I mean, one of the things that I've already mentioned is that is that I um, I felt a certain degree of freedom that I wouldn't, I'm, you know, like, and I, and I think I realized that in retrospect, you know, just because I feel like I'm the type of person, especially as somebody who grew up in the Philippines, I feel like, um, I feel like the people that I collaborated, collaborate with definitely like really heavily affect my work because I'm, I'm thinking a lot about, you know, like the people who are going to be reading this and, and, you know, like the people who um, I'm going to be working with on, you know, on whatever it is I'm working on. And so working with somebody who I knew was familiar with, you know, like with all of these concepts, right? Like with things that you eat in the Philippines and like the way that the houses are, et cetera, et cetera. It gave me this degree of freedom to be able to explain all of those things on their own terms without, you know, like without sort of imagining that I was explaining it to somebody who, you know, who lacked that familiarity. And, and I think that especially now that Google exists, you know, like if people aren't, you know, like if people, people can look stuff up, right? Um, mm -hmm. If there are, you know, kind of like concepts that are unfamiliar to them, because, you know, my, my, um, there are a lot of things that I do explain explicitly in the book, but those are things that are vital for you to understand, you know, kind of like the rest of the experience. But I find the, you know, like I find the explanatory comma which is, you know, which is a burden that so many minorities are asked to do, which is like add, you know, kind of like explanatory notes to things that may be unfamiliar to, um, you know, to an imagined general public actually makes it very difficult to write prose that mm -hmm. is elegant and, you know, and flows well and doesn't feel you know, it doesn't feel overburdened, et cetera, et cetera. And so then, and then the flip side of that, of course, is that the white literary establishment, you know, then, you know, then judges people aesthetically when they have too much explanation in their prose. So it's like a minority double bind, right? And I think, you know, working with an editor um, who's also Filipino, made it made that process like so much easier and i think working on that you know like having that filipino side squared away especially because it was at the beginning of the book 
really, and I tend to write sequentially, really set like a really wonderful tone for me to write the rest of the book that way, you know, like without having all of these, you know, like I don't have a transgender 101, you know, like explanatory section, right? Like you can, you need to just either, you know, like either understand those things through context You're a little frozen, but you'll come back. Let's just wait. Yeah. So it's a good time for folks to write more questions in the ask a question area, if you like. Yes. All right. We're going to help Meredith get back up. Feel free to yeah. Feel free to add a question. Thank you, folks, for joining. I hope you're enjoying it with your dinner or folding laundry or a cocktail. We want to let you know that um, this will immediately be available to rewatch. So if you have friends who live in other parts of the country or other parts of the world who you think would enjoy this please um, send them the link and it's just the link that you watched it. Okay. Hi go. Meredith. Oh, hi. I, hi. I got, I guess I froze. Uh, you looked fine. You look fabulous frozen though. Am I yeah. back? Um, You're back. back. How, when, when did it stop? When did the video stop? Cause I was in a long, <laughs> it was like, I have this like long detailed explanation. So um did at least nope. answer Grace's question partially. I think I think first? so. Yeah. I think so. There's another question here from Ishara. Yes. Hi, Ishara. I'd, I'd like to share with you. Memoir and autofiction have a higher pressure of being hundred percent true and accurate, despite the fact that whatever an author writes is their truth which should be enough. But was there a pressure that you felt either internally or otherwise to be 100% truthful and accurate to real life events? And was there ever a time when a truth to the event didn't feel honest to yourself as a storyteller? Yeah, I mean, those issues are super, super complicated. And I think every author has, you know, like has their own relationship to it. I think of this as the, I think of this as the Tim O'Brien, Mary Carr continuum. This is like, if I, you know, like once I do my, um, you know, like if I ever do a talk, I'll talk about this, right? You know, so Tim O'Brien is on the side of, you know, that the literal truth is not the same as the emotional truth. And Mary Carr is on the side of, it's really important, you know, like for everything in your book to be factually true. And I feel like I'm probably on the Tim O'Brien side of that equation in the sense that, you know, like in the sense that I do feel like every event is experienced from, a, you know, from a particular perspective. So I try as much as possible to be factually true um in my storytelling but at the same time even those facts end up you know kind of like being in dispute right like so much of the time and people you know like people remember events differently and in those cases you know like one of the things that i one of the things that i do is i tell myself well you know like there are actually instances when the memory of something affects you more than you know like what actually literally happened right like in terms of you know like in terms of how it actually um it how it actually projects onto the um onto the rest of your life right um there's a scene recently you know the, there's a small factual error actually that i found recently which is interesting because i published this excerpt in Vulture about a protest that um, I was part of in which I kissed, I was part of a kiss in with um, this guy, Josh Oppenheimer, who has now become a really, you know, who, who was even then a really amazing artist, but he's now a well-known documentary filmmaker. 
um, he, my memory was that he was wearing a nun's habit, like a nun's outfit for the protest. But the actual, but I saw a video recently and what he actually, he actually wore a complete nun's habit usually, you know, which is why I remember him wearing a nun's habit. But for that particular protest, in order to get into the protest, because it was in a, you know, like it was in an enclosed ticketed space, he was only wearing the wimple um, mm -hmm. of the, you know, like of the, um, of the outfit. And I would have probably like found a way to narrate that, um, it, you know, like had I had access to the video, um, you know, like when I was narrating that story. But the fact of the matter is that, you know, because of the fact that I grew up in Catholic school, what I clearly, clearly remember was the image of him like wearing the full nun's outfit rather than just the wimple. I mean, and it's actually possible that that's, that even as I was experiencing that event, I actually wasn't aware that, that he was not actually like wearing the full habit. He was only wearing, you know, because that, because that image of a nun is so powerful for me having, you know, like having spent all of those years in Catholic school. So that's just kind of like a small example of how, you know, like how that operates for me in terms of the gap between the emotional and the factual truth. So interesting. Um, I'm going to move on to my classics questions for you. Yes. This is the, this chapter is called the book, nerdy, nerdy, nerdy book part. Yeah. Um, and I hope Meredith enjoys this part because um, I think one of, I think one of the first times I, I met you, you, you quickly told me about your love for classics. And I, I thought that was neat. And I wanted to share some of these questions with you. So um, is there a particular classic or classic author that has been influential to you as a writer or that you have responded to in Ferris? Uh, ooh, there's so many. There's so many. Um, I feel like a particular one. Ooh, that's so hard. Um, the, the first, the person who comes to mind immediately is George Eliot. Um, I think in part because George Eliot, among, you know, just sort of like 19th century British women authors, um, I feel like is one of these people who is like simultaneously super, super cerebral, yet also like super, super passionate and super, super carnal, you know? And I feel like that combination isn't particularly common. And I feel like in terms of, um, you know, like in terms of the ethos of Ferris, I think that, I think there's definitely inspiration there as far as, you know, like as far as the book simultaneously being like super, super nerdy, but also having all of these like sex scenes and shenanigans, et cetera, et cetera. Sex scene, that was our reading line for, for a fair sex scene and <laughs> shenanigans, but it fell off the, the final jacket. I don't know what happened to that. Um, okay. Is there a classic that you think people should wait to read for a certain age and why? The reason I'm bringing this up is because I spent a lot of time listening to the fact that students sometimes hate reading Penguin mm -hmm. classics in class in high school. And on the other hand, maybe they should wait. What do you think? I feel like I definitely read Hamlet too early. Um, you know, like just, just like thinking about a book that I kind of didn't have a strong positive reaction to reading it. I think I read it junior year of college and sort of wrote off for a little while um, and then only came back to you know, kind of like later. Um, but at the same time, I don't know, you know, like at the same time, I also, as somebody who, <laughs> who throughout my life read things above my grade level, I'm not sure if I can 
generally endorse, you know, like not, you know, like not reading things too soon or like not, not reading, like waiting to read things if you're curious about them. You know, like maybe, maybe in terms of like things that are assigned in school, right? Mm -hmm. Um, you know, like being conscious of, and I always, I always thought it was very strange how apparently like Julius Caesar is a very common Shakespeare play to read sophomore year of high school. I've been told that. And I don't, you know, and I'm always just like, but Twelfth Night is so much more fun. And it's like, you know, like it's so much, it's so much cooler. And like, let's teach, you know, like let's, let's teach Call you know high school sophomores about the possibilities of diverse genders. <laughs> yes, educators, listen to this recommendation. Rather, rather than uh, rather than political machinations. <laughs> yes. Um, okay. What is a classic that you think about in your day to day life, whether for mundane or unusual reasons? Uh, a classic that I think about from in my day to day life. I think about I think about Giovanni's room a lot. Um, I think about passing a lot for obvious reasons. Nella Larson's passing. Um, yeah. One of my one of my weird, you know, kind of like fiction ideas is to actually, you know, like do some sort of adaptation, modern adaptation of Nella Larson's passing, but from the perspective mm. of a trans person, just because mm. so many of the issues that that book raises in terms of race is also, you know, like is also something that so many trans people experience, um, you know, like in contemporary life, right? That for every person like me who has chosen to be out as trans, I actually know a fair number of people who, you know, like who don't, who live now um, at who are trans women who don't, you know, like nobody knows except for, you know, like their very, very close circle of friends that they're trans, right? Um, and that's something, you know, and of course, you know, the issues of passing are still very much contemporary in terms of race as well. But, you know, but I, but I do think that there's a, there's a degree to which I think about, I think about passing a lot. I think about both passing, um, small p and and passing you know good capital italicized p. <laughs> okay uh in your opinion what is the most overrated classic and why what is the most underrated classic and why oh, oh no the glass. Oh. do it do it meredith Tell uh, us. I, I I I think I should probably say the underrated first. Um, I think I think Mansfield Park is severely underrated. Um, I think I feel like it's from a character perspective, it's my favorite Jane Austen novel. And Ian e. Forster agrees with me. If you you know like if you don't agree with my assessment. Um, but and people find Fanny boring because she's like super good. But as somebody who always strives to be good and doesn't quite, you know, get there, I find her, you know, like a really um, amazing character. In terms of uh, classics that are overrated, I have never, I have never gravitated to really large, like really long books by white cisgender men um it's just like never been a genre that i have been attracted to and i'm not attracted to books that are attempting to you know to sort of like theorize everything on the planet you know like i i find it to be like really patriarchal and masculinist <laughs> so i'm not inherently attracted to books like ulysses or infinite jest um despite the fact that you know the, despite the fact that both of those books have you know like a lot to offer i just don't philosophically i'm much more of a virginia wolf person than i am a ulysses person you are so polite <laughs> you are so polite but as you're explaining this all i picture is like a, like a literary classics dating app and you're just like swiping <laughs> 
ruthlessly, <laughs> ruthlessly. <laughs> um, it was so great. That was, that was, was so cool. You actually make that. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, what modern works do you see becoming classics? And what accounts for that classics worthiness? Mm, um, and after this, we can digress on the, you know, complicated term of a, what a canon is because right right, right? but I, first what do you no, think of modern no. works classics are works whose like writing you know like either the form or the issues that the classic raises transcends you know the current moment and like reaches across time um in terms of modern classics, I um, deeply, deeply love Brandon Taylor's real life. Um, I think I think it's going to have, you know, just because of the fact that um, I feel like we we because there has been so much focus on um, just like the long, long uh, important legacy of slavery and. Um, and civil rights and anti-blackness, I feel like Brandon Taylor in his quiet way, as he explores, you know, like just like the really, really tiny things that happen to black people who are, you know, like exceptionalized are not, you know, like being brutalized by the police, not, you know, like not experiencing um, overt racism is like, just like a like, thematically super important but also you know but also like formally the fact that he's able to like write in that sort of like hyper specific emotional mode you know like i feel like is you know like i definitely look for look forward to you know like people reading that book 20 years from now 30 years from now right um so brandon taylor immediately comes to mind um in terms of um, in terms of memoir, um, Casey Lehman's Heavy comes to mind. Um, Chanel Miller's Know My Name comes to mind as you know, like as books that I can see, you know, like being read for a long time. Um, and I really hope that you know, like as an aside, in the states, memoir and um, you know, like memoir and fiction are sort of thought. Fiction is kind of thought of as this more literary category than memoir. Um, and I think it's important to note that that's not true in a lot of different literary environments. Um, you know, like I've studied French, for instance, and for, you know, for the French, the distinction, you know, both of them are literary. Um, and so, you know, one of the things that I hope is that memoir can also, you know, can also occupy um, a similar place as fiction does in, you know, kind of like an American consciousness. And then uh, I'm trying to think of, you know, like of books that I've read recently that um, I feel like I feel like I've named three. So I feel like maybe that's, that's good. Cool. Yeah. Yeah. And I feel like um, it's a fun question to ask also because I like to ask people what they think about the meaning of a canon. You know, I think it's mm -hmm. a very charged term in my business. And for me, it comes with a lot of learning about who the gatekeepers are and history making and what does history making mean. Um, I've just finished uh, reading Dr. Kennedy's book, um, How to Be an Anti-Racist. Right. And it really made me think about um, the, the literature, classic literature and what is deemed to be great literature and thinking of it out of history, just assuming that that those are the titles, right? That you're supposed to one learn in school, two you're supposed to shape you as a reader, as, as an educated person. If you want to be a writer, you're need you're supposed to aspire to be like one of these authors. Um, but I think we're just disrupting all of that. I mean, at least I hope to be doing that with, with Penguin Classics now and questioning what that means. Um, but the qualities that you explain for those three modern works definitely are the qualities that I share in trying to identify works about like that you see a community of readers across time sh yeah. sharing a one work and they could come to it for different reasons. But there's an excellence in that writing. There's a relevance that you can see 
a connection being made to readers, not just in this moment in time. That really, I feel like, is is transcendent. Um, so, and also, I guess, like the other challenge, right, is that we have to recognize that you know, like writing um, often entails material privilege, right? Especially, you know, like especially when you consider periods prior to the 20th century. And so, you know, like it becomes a really, you know, like it really becomes a difficult balancing act to simultaneously acknowledge that, for instance, you know, like Jane Austen really did introduce, you know, like there's no way that you can, you know, deny the fact that this particular figure who happens to have all of her cultural and social biases also, you know, like introduced a particular form in the novel, right? Um, you know, like a particular way of um, of narration um, in the novel. And so, and so I think that, you know, like maybe it, maybe it entails, you know, rather than simply, um, you know, like rather when we think about canon, you know, Meredith is frozen again, but Meredith will come back. We, we just have to live with the vagaries of internet wherever. The vagaries of internet, because Meredith had some wisdom about the canon and we still have our lovely, have like, ah, um, Meredith. Oh yeah. <laughs> you were frozen for a little bit. Oh, okay. Can, can you uh, backtrack your giving wisdom about the canon? Oh yeah, um, you know the, the thing that I was going to say was that is that we can't really that if we're thinking about the novel, for instance, you know, like the novel's development happened through specific figures, and it's very hard to um, you know like it's very hard to avoid the fact that those figures are you know European are are white European and that they carry with them all of these cultural and social biases, right? And I think that there's been so much criticism that's been, you know, the, the, the role of criticism is, all, is also important in thinking about canon formation, that it's not just who we read, but also like how we read them, that it's possible to simultaneously, you know, kind of like recognize I was using Austin as an example, you know, the like Jane Austen as this enormous, amazing innovator um, in terms of the novel form, while also at the same time being able to critique the ways in which, you know, the ways in which, for instance, she didn't, you know, she didn't really address issues of, you know, like issues of race in her books. Right? Um, Great. Okay. I have one more question. Okay. Outside of books, what other work of art, movies, albums, sneakers, paintings, do you consider classic and why? Oh, uh, <laughs> we, can, we can go on for a long time. Um, Felix Gonzalez Torres is a really important um, artistic inspiration for me. Um, I, in terms of dance, I trained at the Merce Cunningham studio and, you know, like I'm a huge fan of Merce Cunningham and Trisha Brown and, you know, like these modern dance um, class, you know, like these modern dance creators. Um, and then movie classics. I'm trying to think of movie classics. My, see, the, the funny thing is that, you know, like I have super snobby tastes in books, but in movies, you know, like I love teen movies, right? So, you know, so Mean Girls, I think, is, you know, like is very oh, much gosh. a movie classic or um, Bring It On or 13 Going On 30, right? Um, and, is that the one with the dollhouse at the end? 13 yeah. Going On 30. Oh, yeah. my goodness. My 12 year old watched that and um, we went through a whole box of Kleenex afterwards. Yeah, yeah. No, it's, it's pretty. Um, it's a pretty affecting, it's a pretty affecting <laughs> movie. Um, and then what else? Music. Uh, yeah. Albums, art, sneakers. Albums. albums. Yeah. 
albums. Uh, in terms, yeah, like I, I, do I listen to albums? That's a good question. Like I don't, I guess like I listen to a lot of classical music. Um, uh, so uh, Hector Berlioz's uh, Symphony, uh, Symphony Fantastique is one of like my, um, and then uh, the music to Tchaikovsky's Romeo and Juliet. I, I pretty much, you know, like know the choreography to a lot of Romeo and Juliet wow. whenever I'm like relaxing. I just basically like picture these variations, you know, I just play them oh, in my head. Um, yeah, and uh, I'm trying to think if there's if there's anyone else that I've missed. Um, um, I'm really enjoying the art of Hank Willis Thomas, um, who is this amazing uh, black contemporary artist who uses the the sort of language of advertising in order to critique, mm -hmm. um, you know, the commercialism and blackness. So. Um, those are the only people who come to mind. And I love uh, Nicole Ponseca and Jeepney and what she's doing with Filipino food. It's also yes. Shout out to Miss Ponseca. <laughs> she was born beyond, you know, the thing that I appreciate about uh, Nicole Ponseca's work is that she's also a builder of community. Mm. And I don't think I've seen that as as successfully done um, as she has in terms of bringing uh, particularly a younger generation of Filipinos together. Um, you you know, food is so special to have to have, you know, commune with someone, but um, the sense that she has of family, you know, right. in her business of, of, of Jeepney and Maharlika is really tangible and just it's delicious in every way. Yeah. Um, so I am so grateful that you've given me this chance to have some chismes with you. And I wanted to encourage people to go to Karis Books. And if you don't have a copy of Ferris, please pick one up and pick one up for a friend, a family member, a stranger. Um, Ferris Forward, for instance, you know, give it to somebody that you think will really enjoy Meredith's story. And um, I think, do you have any other words you'd like to share before we finish off, Meredith? I, I just wanted to, you know, like, thank you so much for all of your wonderful support and, you know, like all of our, you know, like all of the work that we've done through multiple drafts and your patience and your wonderfulness and, um, and yeah, like it, it's, so um, it's so wonderful to be able to do this like last official virtual tour event with you. It just feels really apt and um, and special, and um, and hopefully you know like hopefully you know like next time we can do an event together, it can be in real life. Yes, definitely. definitely. <laughs> and thank well, you so much, everybody, for yeah. and asking such wonderful questions. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, ER. Yes, my pleasure. Um, thank you both. This was really lovely. So at the bottom of your screen, there's a teal button that says Buy Ferris um, from Karis Books and More. So you can just click that and be taken directly to it. Um, and I am going to put our special um, uh, contribution button up there. We know people are in all different places on the economic map at this moment in the pandemic. So um, all of our events are free, but if you are able to sponsor any of our events um, by making a small contribution, we greatly appreciate it. And um, we hope that you'll come back to our other events. So we, we're we doing events all the time online. So please, please check us out no matter where in the world you live. Uh, there's always something and uh, we'd love for you to visit with us online regularly. So thank you for spending this evening with us. It was really lovely. Um, I hope everybody stays safe and happy in the in the coming months. And um, go go get Ferris. It is um, it's waiting for you. We're we're so 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 um, thrilled to have this in the world. It's an important contribution. So thank you. Thank you yeah. so much. All right, everybody, have a good night. Thank good everybody. night. Good night.